Hi everyone and welcome back to Love, Sex and Magic. I'm so grateful that you decided to join us today. I have one of my dear friends, Aaron Rose, joining me today. He is a Oh, just such such a gift. He is a spiritual teacher, real. Um, he's a he's a leader for leaders and a guide for leaders of the new earth. He's also a uh, social justice and diversity and inclusion expert. And the way that he shows up online, um, especially throughout this year, has just been so um, so powerful for me and so um, just so inspiring. And I've really felt so called to share his incredible work and his message with you today. So I hope that you love this episode. Aaron, welcome to Love, Sex and Magic. Thank you so much for having me. It is truly, just truly such a a joy to be here with you in this moment. Mm, Likewise. I'm so excited for this podcast interview. I mean, well, this conversation, we had this conversation, we had a conversation (laughs) back in, I believe, March when we all went down into lockdown for the first time. And um, we both kind of tuned in, didn't we, afterwards? Because it was about a couple of months later that it was due to come out. And it was like, for whatever reason, it feels as though this doesn't feel the right time to release this episode anymore. 100%. And it's it's interesting. I was thinking back on it. It's actually completely astrologically synced because we did it in May and we've been in this six-month cycle with a bunch of the major planets being retrograded. And right just this week, there's like a whole new sort of a lot of placements are changing and there's a real like reset happening. And so it is like we're we're, we're revisiting everything after – a very discreet kind of cosmic chapter. Oh, well, perfect. We were very in tune then, weren't we? Yes. I love it. Well, I just absolutely adore you and your incredible voice, your incredible work, um, the way that you're able to hold such complexity, so many different complexities of the world events and what's happening right now with the collective, but but always with so much love in your heart for every single person's experience. And I I deeply feel you every time I consume your content, visit your page, watch you on story. I just feel so, um, I feel like deep love for you, Aaron, and a deep connection with you. And I feel that your vision for the world is my vision for the world too. (laughs) It means so much to hear that. And and the feelings mutual. We have very much feels like we, we were like, okay, you're going to go in and what, what, whatever it was, January of 1990, I'll go in in July, 1990. We'll catch up eventually, <laughs> you know, Aquarian mission. Yes. Yeah. So tell me what, where is Aquarius in your chart? Are you North Node Aquarius? North Node Aquarius. So yeah. you know, we're part of that generation that came in in that very specific window where it's like really the highest expression of who we're here to be mm-hmm. is is that sort of collective peacemaker and really understanding how to work with the collective in a different way. Um, and my moon is in Aquarius as well. And so mm-hmm. that's definitely that it's definitely deeply the way that my subconscious and my like emotions and sense of sort of safety work is with people who are on that kind of futuristic visionary agenda. Yeah, totally. And I'm Aquarius Sun, Aquarius Moon, and Aquarius North Node as well. So, wow. Yeah, very, very. So, <laughs> I'm a, a, a epitome of Aquarius. And now we're moving into the age of Aquarius. Um, so, very, very exciting. Okay, so for people that are not familiar with your work, I'd love if we could start with what is your why for you and what is your why for the world? In some ways, the why for me in the world has always been the same. There's always been this kind of inextricable link between what I feel compelled to do. And then it's always been like, okay, and everybody else needs to come with me, which I think is very Aquarian, where it's like, I don't want, you know, the the other side of Aquarius is Leo, which is like the king in the castle. I'm like, I don't want to just be sitting in a a beautiful reality. I want you all to come with me. (laughs) We're all supposed to be together. Um, And, you know, I had a childhood it was very dark in many different ways and and really you know in growing up you know within my family but also even just within 1990s New York like that was completely ravaged and really just from an early age seeing so much injustice and so much not just injustice but I always saw it as like misalignment I was like it's not supposed to be like this it's all it's supposed to be 
better than this. And I was always in relationship with that kind of reality of peace and, and justice and, and love. And there was always a sense of like, we just have to all get on the same page and just agree and then we can change things. There was almost like that youthful naivete um, or just idealism. And so my why has always been freedom. It's always been, what is it? what does it look like to be completely free to be who I am, but to have that who I am not be based on trauma, but be based on like God's highest vision for me to be a human being who's an expression of love and creativity and all of those things that we innately know is, is who we really are beyond all of the labels, all of the identities. Um, and and then, you know, for the collective, it's always been as soon as I feel like I've figured something out or I'm at a new level, I am always speaking about it and wanting to, yeah, wanting to co-create it with others. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I totally, I totally feel you and I feel very connected as well with, with what you're saying about just always wanting to bring people along. And as soon as you've got to a new level, it's like, come on, guys, like, look at this. We've just reached this next level in the PlayStation and we want to share it with everyone immediately. And it has felt like this year we've been like kind of, um, uh, you know, unplugging from the matrix or seeing through the matrix and kind of upgrading these levels of reality where we're able to kind of see in like almost like see the matrix from outside of it rather than being so in it all the time um yeah. so i mean we'll, we'll talk about that later <laughs> but i'd love to kind of go back to a bit more of your story because when we first met each other i think a couple of years ago um we were introduced to each other or I was introduced to you on Instagram. Um, and you at the time were very heavily, I mean, you have been very heavily invested all, always in a social justice work. Um, you've been a diversity and inclusion specialist, which was the work that you were doing when I discover you discovered you. Um, so talk to us a bit about like, how did you get into that world and what was your experience like, um, in that world? Yeah, my journey with social justice is it's almost like as soon as I was able to be even remotely autonomous, you know, when you start to hit that like 13, 14, 15 year old place where you, you think that you have the consciousness of an adult and you are starting to be more autonomous in your reality. As soon as I was there, I was like, OK, social justice, let's go. It's time to change the world. I was you know, super inspired by people like Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa and Gandhi and I'm okay, like all of these revolutionary leaders who had shaped the world in really the few decades before I had been born. And it started out in my high school where I became a self-appointed peer educator and went around. Somehow like, we convinced our, our history teachers and our English teachers to let us skip lunch and study hall and come in and give presentations about social issues. Wow. So I would come in there and be like, surprise, guys, you don't have to listen to your teacher today. You're going to be vaguely traumatized by me revealing all of the details of like the malaria epidemic to you or <laughs> genocide in Darfur. And like, did you know that this is happening? But it was always, we called it think globally, act locally. So it was like a lot of information about what's happening in the world with that kind of youthful vigor. But then we always brought it down. It was like, okay, so what can you do, right? We're going to have a concrete action that you random 16 year old <laughs> in your history class can do um, in order to participate in the change. And so from a very early age, it was like that ability to hold space and to just let people know about what was happening and to, and to, to find that heart resonance, to invite them into understanding and, and then being part of the change for something that so many people often just, they, they get hit with a sense of overwhelm. And so I was always, you know, really, committed to helping people see that change was inevitable if we could just believe that it was possible. And so from that place, I was doing that kind of peer education, but I very quickly got involved in a lot more radical activism. So by the time I was like 18, 19 years old, I was doing things like marching in the streets and organizing hundreds and thousands of people and doing things like putting ice sculptures in the lobbies of corporate buildings and letting them melt to protest their um, participation in 
what we thought was, you know, fossil fuel use that was contributing to climate change and was involved in food justice activism and labor rights activism and so many different forms of just that kind of justice work around seeing this is what's wrong in the world and we can organize to make a difference. Um, and so that's really where it started. And by the time I was in my late teens, I was a full on activist, like organizing people, marching in the streets. Like I, some people have like, you know, that sixth sense for playing an instrument. I have a sixth sense for like how to avoid police capture while <laughs> marching through the streets <laughs> and how to, <laughs> and how to read a crowd. And, you know, cause I did it at such a young age that it's just drilled into my brain at this point. And, um, you know, movements for environmental justice and human rights and, you know, doing direct action, like, chaining ourselves to coal plants and putting large ice sculptures in the lobbies of corporate buildings who were participating in what we thought was excessive fossil fuel use to make some kind of statement about what they were doing to the Arctic and letting the ice melt and getting dragged yeah. away and all of that. And, and, you know, I was, I think I was drawn to the intensity of that activism because of the intensity of the issues, right? It was like, mm -hmm. I want to, people understand that How there's something it is. Wrong. yeah yeah and but through that you know my my deepest I'd say calling or sort of where I felt most organically myself was when I was teaching it was when I was you know we were organizing hundreds of student activists to come together and I got to like design the curriculum right and I got to um, help people and sit with them and, and hear what was going on emotionally for them and help us figure out how to tell the story of why we cared about what we did. And I have the blessing of, you know, there's been obviously many ups and downs in my work and my career, but when I look at the thread, it's so organic. It's like one thing after another, being an activist and then, you know, being invited to speak more places than being invited to lead workshops then. And it really evolved more and more into this sort of supporting leaders and becoming who they truly were, as well as supporting communities and really understanding like, how do we actually live our values? How do we take this extremely polarized culture that we're in and rise above it in a way that's not just about papering over the pain of the past? And so I've definitely, I've had stints in doing a lot of diversity and inclusion work, and that's still very much a part of what I do. Um, but ever the, the sort of mercurial Sagittarian Aquarian, there's always like a next expression of the work. But when I look back, it's like the things that inspired me when I was 15, I'm reading those same books right now, mm -hmm. right? The same message of, of, of radical love and the possibility of liberation has, yeah, has been the thread yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Yeah, and that definitely comes through in your work that you really are here for the liberation of all beings and the the freedom of all beings. And, you know, I love that you share that, um, you know, you have been in that world where you've been, you know, a keyboard warrior and like really um, almost thinking that that kind of way of um, – being right so other people could be wrong so they could see how their wrongness was affecting everything else and you know yeah. now the way you show up is you have such um you have such grace and you have such a way of holding both sides of of every um situation that you see um that we all see in the, in the planet and i'd love if you could speak into that because you've said you know so many times you know if we want peace then um committing to violence as an act of revolution doesn't fully get us where we actually all want to be. Um, and in this world at the moment, we're seeing people say, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. And there's this kind of pressure on us to be angry about every, all of the issues all the time. So where, where do you stand now? What's your message for this? Oh, my message is really about the alignment of means and ends, understanding that how we do the work is the work, understanding that where we want to go, whatever that resolution looks like, it's really our responsibility and our opportunity to embody that in this now moment and to, and to move as if it's already done. And that comes from my experience being an activist. And 
you know, as I continued to grow up and my frontal lobe continued to, you know, finish cooking and I had my critical thinking come online a little bit more, I started to see, I started to really just question. I was like, interesting. Everybody that I'm protesting with, everybody's really sad. Like we love each other and we're having a great time, but people are exhausted. I remember when it was like a big deal when I would get paid like a thousand dollars for maybe like three months worth of work, you know, just very, very, very little money. And I remember thinking like, when are like, just almost with, again, with that kind of like the way a kid asks a question, like, when do we, when do we, when's the line going to be crossed where we get to act like we're free? Mm. Like, and, and I, and I kept seeing us all collapsing on, on the doorstep of utopia, <laughs> exhausted <laughs> and out of alignment with our values. <laughs> And I would see that moment and I would say, okay, like what would need to happen in that moment for us to become an embodiment of the utopia that we seek? Oh, all this stuff would have to get upgraded. Oh, that's actually the work. Mm -hmm. That's actually, you know, we want peace. We have to learn how to be peaceful now. If we want respect, we have to learn how to respect ourselves now. And I'm talking also about even to, you know, in this really literal sense too, where I was a a union organizer. So I was doing a lot of work um, supporting workers in fighting unfair working conditions. And then I was going to the union office and seeing people be sexually harassed. And it was like, how <laughs> are we fighting for workers justice and this workplace is not safe? Mm. Yeah. And so it's, for me, it's about that. And I'm about radical commitment too. It's like, it's not necessarily that it's going to be easy, but it's understanding that we're not going to get there until we really stake our claim to living as we will when it is done. And part of that too, people often mistake that for spiritual bypassing and like an, a, a suppression of emotion. From one perspective, I completely agree that if you're not angry right now, you're not paying attention because you certainly have anger within you. There are certainly parts of you that feel deeply wronged by the world and are learning in new ways, the ways in which you have been wronged. Um, but I think that you know where a lot of people get stuck is that they loop in the catharsis. Like we almost need more permission for catharsis. We need more permission for expression of emotion, but in a way that actually gives people the witnessing that they that they desire. And that's what I try to do in my work too. I'm like, rage it out, baby. <laughs> like, let me know how you feel. And then from that place, we can actually authentically begin to move into a different experience. Mm. Um, and this is something that you know, really every radical leader who radically changed the world in a, it, you know, we can see their fingerprint on the, the structure of our world right now. Someone like MLK and the people that worked with him, someone like Bayard Rustin, who is a, a civil rights organizer, they were all saying the same thing. If we want a society of peace, it must be achieved by peaceful means. Mm-hmm. If we want a democracy, we have to get it democratically. Mm. And if I dehumanize someone else, I dehumanize myself. And, and they were, you know, MLK said things like bomb my home and I will still love you. And that was his radical stance. And that's also what got him killed. That commitment to love, not a commitment to other forms of organizing. So powerful. It's so, so true. Like these revolutionaries have been able to revolutionize, revolutionize the world and create these changes through love uh, through feeling the anger and you know being in that emotion and then moving towards peace uh not staying in the us versus them uh thing and i think we're we're seeing this a lot right now in obviously we're we're post well i want to say we're post-election but obviously there's still a lot of uncertainty (laughs) i don't really know whether to say we're post-election to be honest like i think we think we're post-election and then on the other hand there's um, you know, half of the half of America um, believing that there's um, uh, fraud and recounts, and uh, you know the media have announced Biden, but the media wasn't responsible for announcing Biden, and um, everyone's celebrating the Biden win, <laughs> and it's quite concerning how much power the media has over the entire world, and this is definitely you know something we talked I touched a little bit earlier on like you know seeing the matrix and you know breaking out of the matrix and for me this year I've really seen for the first time so clearly how manipulative the media is um and I also woke up 
really harshly this year to um, a lot of issues in the world that I had no idea about, like um, that I didn't really know the severity of, like child trafficking. Um, like I didn't understand that the that the world was run by. Um, a, a small group of people. I kind of knew it because you kind of know that, but then you don't really, really understand how that completely controls the rest of the world and how everything else is influenced by that. And then obviously the Black Lives Matter movement, again, like I was in absolute um, anger and rage and tears and anxiety over you know, I knew this was happening, but I didn't know quite to the level of pain that was, um, that was really going on for so many people. And it, and it broke my heart. And I think this year has done, this has done that for so many people around the world has just completely broken them in two and broken them open. What's your advice for, for people right now that are, you know, have been exposed to all of this, um, all of this pain in the world. And they're really, you know, kind of how how you were when you were such a young um Aquarian North Noder and you were like here are, oh my god I'm seeing all the problems I need to do everything like what's your advice for people uh, that are so angry and so upset about all of these different things going on in the world and and they just feel so overwhelmed by it all mm. yeah the first thing that comes through is really just that reminder, the back to basics reminders, right? Where it's like, are, you know, if we want revolution, if we're going to utopia, if we're going to a world where we all thrive, we are definitely sleeping enough. We're drinking water. Mm -hmm. We're breathing. We're going outside and putting our face in the sun for a few minutes every day. We have enough time to pet the dog that walks by, you know, like real sort of back to basics, honoring your own humanity in a moment by moment way, I think is incredibly important because one of the biggest programming things that we're dealing with is so many of us have ancestrally, whether you think about it DNA wise or past life wise or both, we have, we have that, the urgency of like, Oh my God, like if I don't get this done, it's not going to be okay. And we've, we've had that experience of it being too little too late. And that that fear is really programmed into us and you could think about it in terms of activism you could think about it in terms of like just hustle hustle culture and everybody who's like you know look where i got in 2020 you know get off the couch and and and, and get it get it right now and that kind of right now anxiety i just want to invite people to breathe a little bit of spaciousness into that and to understand that like truly you won't create the change that you want if you're doing it in a way that dishonors you as a human being and where you're sacrificing core aspects of your well-being in order to do it. And then the second thing I would say is really inviting people into a deeper relationship with God, like a deeper connection with the understanding that we do have an infinite love, infinitely loving creator who is here with us and who can support us and that we can lean into, right? And, and who, however you think about it, like there's a realm of perfect peace where it's already done and we're all here to play our role, but we don't have to hold the weight of the world on our shoulders. Um, we really, we have the ability to be deeply supported and to be deeply guided to say, okay, I feel really stressed out about all these issues. What is my role? What is my next right action? Mm -hmm. Because if we're each doing that with grace and with intention, then we become the little, you know, all the metaphors, like all the little bees in the hive, we become this beautiful symphony um, because there's plenty of things that if I, you know, if I didn't have a clear sense of what I'm supposed to do, I would be freaking out and running in a million different directions and trying to run like 5,000 campaigns at once. Mm -hmm. So that there's a real invitation as well to do your job and do it well um, and to make space for the emotion, right? To, to really, people look at me and, and I think sometimes assume that I'm like, oh, he's super happy. And I really am. <laughs> but also like I, I process my emotions in an extremely active way. I probably scream out loud every single day. 
Like I will drive in my car, I will yell, I will punch pillows, I will work out, I will go for a run, I will write in my journal, I will cry out to God, and I let the emotion pass through. And I think that for people to separate the space between emotional catharsis and what needs to happen Mm -hmm. is helpful too, because the emotions are often attached to like that deeper trauma response that's trying to process out before we can actually take right action from from sort of a clearer place Mm, mm, I love that and I love the um reminder of like asking ourselves what is mine to do because what I, I I've had this experience this year of like right what is mine to do okay what is my job here as a as a human as a as a person of this earth an inhabitant of this earth and also as a leader you know as a as someone with influence what is my work to do and you know really doing the inner work I believe is such a such an integral part of this and when I want to ask you a question and I'm not really sure how to word this but I'm just going to let it just come out how it means to come out you'll get it telepathically yeah what 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 about there's like almost an encouragement happening to call people out Mm. And if we are focused on what is my work to do, does that does that mean that everyone just focuses on themselves and and the calling out of others or the calling in is others? Uh, where does where's the place for that? It's mm. a great question. Call out culture is something that I've I've had my eye on since I was part of it and chose to exit it, um, and since you know my my really deep diversity and inclusion days, really seeing the way that, you know, there, there is in any healthy society, there is, there's, there's a function of sort of disclosure in front of the group, right. Where there's, where there's honesty and where there's an accounting for things that have happened in, you know, in a lot of sort of more traditional cultures that are closer to, I think a little bit more of how we organically operate. There isn't really a system of punishment, you just have to say when you've hurt someone, you have to say it in front of the whole group <laughs> and you have to be witnessed in that. And then there's often kind of like a, you know, a couple of days process where you're kind of in that energy and then everybody's like, great, we're moving on. Um, and so I think that there's a part of us that seeks that kind of disclosure and and we're hungry for it because we know that there is so much being hidden. And so many of us have that experience you can think about it just growing up in a world where you know that what you're being told on the media is a lie. Even if you don't know it, your body knows it, mm. right? Like a kid knows when their parents lying to them, even if they don't really get it. It's like we physiologically, we know that we're in vast deception. And then that's mirrored down into our family dynamics where a lot of us have had the experience of seeing something and feeling something and being told, no, that's not real. And we've been wanting to have that catharsis of like, see, I told you that person really is bad. And so I see that playing out where we're all kind of seeking that ability to claim our truth. And I also see the way in which it is completely being misused and people are offloading their pain rather than actually having the tools to deal with it. And they're making entire careers out of attempting to destroy other people who are nuanced human beings just like they are. And I just personally feel like there's so much more room for grace needed. Because when we give people that space, they organically, most people organically begin to step up more. And I'm not, you know, it's kind of paradoxical for me to be speaking about like um, giving advice about not giving people advice (laughs) or, or taking a stand about, you know, about other people's behavior, about whether or not we should take stands about other people's behavior. Um, And in some ways, I think it's a personal choice where it's like for individual people to say, like, what am I getting out of calling someone out online? Hmm. And is that the way that I would hope someone would do that for me if I was out of integrity? And is that the way that we're going to do it when we're on the other side of this mess? And honestly, I'll I'll end it by saying like, am I available for a resolution? What am I subconsciously picturing 
at the end of this call out. And if it's the destruction of another human being, we got to dream a little bit bigger. Mm. Like, are you available to someone responding gracefully and you healing together and moving forward? And if not, I think that that's a growth area for all of us. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And it comes back to that inner work. Like I, I, you know, having that moment of like, why am I doing this? Like, what's the intention behind this call out or this, uh, cancel, cancel this person, cancel this company, cancel this because they've, they've missed the mark. Um, instead of actually addressing it, you know, giving them the, giving them the accountability and giving them the chance to, Hey, here's, here's what we see. And here's, what we feel would have been a better response or here's where we feel like you're missing the mark. Like let's, let's move there together. Let's see what we can do to get there together. And that is the world that we all say that we're trying to create this peace, this unity, this, this, um, this joining together of, of these different sides. And this year we've seen so much division, so much us versus them, red versus blue. Um, if you said this, this means that you equals this. And if you voted for this person, that means you are this and you are canceled automatically. Um, and it's a, I, I think it's a scary place for people to be online this year because there's also so much, um, pressure to show up online, having all the answers and having the perfect saying the perfect thing posting at the right time um it's almost like keeping keeping everyone that's watching happy with what we have said about a certain thing even if it's not in complete alignment and integrity for us to actually say that thing yeah. completely and i've been see i've seen that for my clients for myself right we're really and i saw that coming into 2020 i was like we're going to be in such heightened polarization and, to, and, we're, and our nervous systems are going to be bombarded in a way that we can't even conceive of. And I think it's really, it's shown a lot of us like the depth of connection with God, the depth of, of alignment with, with our values and, and really like the work that it takes to stay sustainable and to stay in integrity while showing up online and like this balance between being so integrated in your truth that you're not just showing up like flipping people off and being like, well, this is what's real. Get on my level or, 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 or leave. But also kind of the, the space beyond that is like, this is what's real. And like, if you vibe, stick around. And can we also build community that's not based on ideological co coherency, mm. but actually around values and giving people the grace and the space to continue to live those values, even if it doesn't look the way we thought it would. Mm. Yeah, I completely hear you. Amen. And I actually had a conversation with someone in my DMs a few weeks ago around the um, around the election time, and I shared um, a graphic that was on, on my story that was about like the red and the blue joining hands and coming together, and it said something along the lines of. Um, uh, compassion first everything else la everything else next or togetherness and unity uni union first everything else second or humanity first something like that right and um someone responded basically saying no you know because the the people that voted for trump are all racist and are all this you know this is what they believe and blah 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 and i said you have to understand that I actually, what I actually believe, what I feel is that actually the people on the red and the people on the blue actually do want the same things, do have the same values, but we have all been fed different media this year that has said that each of these, um, each of these candidates are the um, representation of those values and are going to drive us towards the world that we want. But I don't believe that people that are voting for a certain candidate are you know all voting for racism voting for white supremacy um i feel deep <laughs> deeply in my body that that is not what has occurred this year and that we do not have half of america that wants to be at war and wants racism to continue and wants white supremacy to continue i deeply feel and i am not american however 
I deeply feel that we do all want the same thing deep down on a fundamental level. And we have to be able to see through this kind of layer of who said what and who voted for who and actually get to the, like, the human being again. Like, what do we deeply desire more than anything? And we do all want the same thing. I really, really do believe that. I completely agree. I, f- it, I see the same values expressed differently. Mm-hmm the same core values with different ideas about what will bring them about within an extremely controlling like bind on the collective consciousness that means that you have to be in one place or another and then the subconscious attachment it's literally like what they do in congress and they're like okay here's this bill about recycling but we're going to put in all these random things about like sending weapons to other countries too and we're just going to like st- they they add all these things on and i feel like that's what these different camps are it's like well if you're this then you're this 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 like you kind of have to accept all these other things and it's just you know it's deeply it's just deeply offensive to our human nature and it's this conversation in some ways what we're saying is so obvious and people and i remember hearing people talk about it like it's something i've heard my whole life but i think that where the growth space is is like we, we write it off as obvious and then we don't actually let it land with us because we, we still feel so trapped in the system. We're like, well, yeah, you know, everybody's living the same values, but like, and then we kind of loop back into the polarization rather than saying like, what does it look like to start to divest my consciousness mm. from this structure and to, yeah, to not slip back slip back into feeling like, well, yeah, that's true. But like, this is the system we've got, which I think is what a lot of people mm. do. And the, they focus in on like, well, but this election, just this one, got to get through this first, <laughs> then we can all about peace. And it's like, I remember being in 2004 when George W. Bush was elected for the second time. And I was super traumatized by the Iraq war and what I saw happen in my beloved New York after 9-11. And I remember seeing, feeling everybody around me be like, okay, guess it's four years before anything good can happen in the world and like that just that sense of just such inorganic limitation Mm. yeah yeah Mm. and I think part of the problem like a huge part of the problem is none of us have really been educated on how these systems actually work so the information that people have that they're basing that everyone's basing stuff on is extremely limited and the systems are so complex that very few people truly understand the nuance of what each candidate stands for and how the electoral system actually works not just in America but all over the place and I I feel that people um, get a small amount of information about someone and decide based on that without like truly understanding the the complexity of these systems and i it it makes me angry that we have not been empowered to understand them because there i feel tricked i feel lied to i feel kept in the dark as a citizen of this planet you know that this isn't a part of our basic uh, schooling education you know to to understand how our world runs and who's running it and and how it all how it all works it's extremely hard to to learn i i found it really hard to get my head around even even just refreshing the page on election night i was like i still don't understand how they're getting to this from this like how does this all work um so i i feel that you know a huge part of this is people need to be empowered to understand these systems or we need to create new systems that we actually do we actually can get behind I completely agree. And, and and that critical thinking, like really just letting ourselves in some ways, like what I was saying before, it's almost just like, if you have a question, let yourself ask it. Mm. There's so many questions that people are like, well, I don't really get what's going on with the electoral college, but like, I just need to know, like my dopamine receptors are just waiting for like the hit of seeing the check mark next to the name that I want. And then I'm just going to forget about all of this. And, and you just feel, oh, you feel the the spell of the media, the way that it's just, there's these two spaces that you can be in and they're two completely different worlds. And then there's a lot of people that don't fit in to either of them, but there's just, oh, they're so, they're, they're literally like physical structures, but on a consciousness level. Mm, mm, Yeah, no, absolutely. And you've, 
you've briefly, I just want to pivot slightly because you've mentioned a couple of times throughout this interview, um, you've talked about God and God's, um, you know, God's wish for us. And I feel that, you know, I love, I've, I've recently reclaimed the word God. I have used the word universe when I've talked about spirituality and us being spiritual beings for many years. Now I'm feeling really good reclaiming that word God. And I know that everyone has their own individual meaning of that word and, and their own individual relationship with that word. And I see you now really stepping into allowing people to, 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 it kind of express their confusion and unpack their um, unpack their religion and spiritual uh, religious and spiritual beliefs and conditioning um, in your space as well. And so I see that I can feel that for people listening, they still might, may be triggered by the word God. There may be some like real um, religious association and conditioning, you know, tied to that. And I'd love to hear more about how this is a part of the same conversation um, and what you would say to people that are feeling like I'm loving what Aaron's saying, but the God thing, I'm just, I'm not with, I, it's you missing me there. Totally. And I love the way your mind works because I can see you making the same connections that I make around ideology and control and the way that religious structure has been used to enslave people on a consciousness level and this idea, you know, I think and maybe it's Marion Williamson or probably every other spiritual teacher who says something like at some point you have to make a choice about whether or not you live in a benevolent universe or not. Mm. And that idea of like, do you actually have a relationship with an experience of infinite possibility or are you like Indiana Jones, just like bushwhacking your way through some chaotic jungle video game that... <laughs> with a machete just hoping you're going to make it out alive and it's completely unpredictable like hunger game style um or you know do you have an ally do is there is there truth and peace and love that's available to all of us um and you know what's come through for me when you know when i say god i use it very consciously i also used to say like source universe and have these different ways of expressing it but really this year in the last year, God has really pushed me to say, you have to say God because it's going to bring up everything. <laughs> if we say universe, people are still walking around with extremely deep religious programming and trauma that's just in them. But when we say God, and when we say it, when I say it from a place of just feeling so loved and so supported, and I say that also as someone who was raised Catholic and had deeply traumatic experiences with religion and God, when we say it, then it brings up stuff that so that we can actually lean into it and clear it and then move forward more free. And this year, I, with this heightened ideological polarization, I was really guided to begin to speak much more openly about the relationship with God that has guided my hope, my optimism, my love for many years and to kind of invite people into that conversation more because truly, I mean, who are we to say like who God really is? But it's very clear that God is beyond any human structure. And my experience of God is infinite possibility and infinite love that heals all situations. That when I offer up anything that feels like a conflict, like Democrat versus Republican, like where am I, you know, it seems like I have an intractable conflict with someone like, oh, there's not enough money for this or, oh, you know, I got a flat tire, whatever it is, big, small, you know genocide to you know your, your grocery bill when we offer it up my experience is always miraculous provision always unforeseen beautiful things happening and you know we can talk about universal law and our ability to kind of hack this world and we can talk about social justice but my experience is, is that god God is the most efficient way to everything that we want, right? And and that every and, and that God want God has the same dream for us. Like in the infinite love from which we come wants us to return to that love. Um, and so, it, for me, it's really about knowing that we have that support and giving people the space to just purge out everything that religion has done to them as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's it's so beautiful, and it's it's probably very new for people to hear someone talk 
about God without meaning that without being in this in a religion and like he said God is beyond human structure and religion is a human structure right so I would love if you could share a little bit more about your um you you post a lot I see you say like heaven on earth is here like we we are creating the new world right now heaven on earth is here talk to us about creating heaven on earth I'd love for this to be like just such a beautiful way to to end this podcast yeah heaven on earth it's what comes through for me is actually is jesus right this this beautiful being who came as as a living embodiment of god's love people literally murdered him and he was loved throughout the entire thing and when he came back after that experience and he rose from the dead he what he gave people was this prayer which a lot of people have a lot of trauma around which is the our father but and it's been used in you know, a lot of Christian contexts, but in it, it says on earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. And the original Greek says on earth as it already is in heaven. It's like, it's a reality that's right here, right now. And I always say like, if it's not happening, if it wouldn't happen in heaven, it shouldn't be happening here. And for me, it's about understanding God as perfect peace, God as perfect love. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, put a little addendum here for anybody who was triggered by me talking about Jesus, like really just feeling beyond religion, the promise of that love and the peace that, that he was, you know, knowing that if God is infinite love and God is, is infinite truth, we have the ability to move with that authority on earth. We have the ability to say with our free will voices, you know, we, we have that, that, that sovereign voice that says, you know, if I'm really clear on what I don't want to experience and what I do, I have to be listened to. And we have the power to say, this is not holy. Like this is not how humanity should be living. And when we do that, we realign ourselves with that reality of, of heaven, with that reality of, of perfect peace. And it's, it's something that I have personally experienced in my life coming from so much trauma and so much darkness and literally just feeling like as soon as I came to God, like I was airlifted out of it <laughs> and brought to this new realm that I get to operate in now where anything truly is possible. And, and I, I deeply believe that it is our birthright and our opportunity and our responsibility in this life to not tell stories of limitation, to not say, oh, that's just how it is. Mm. Right? It's just going to be like that. You know, those people are going to be like that. We're going to be dealing with that forever. Mm. And to take a radical stance of possibility and to say, you know, on earth as it is in heaven right now, like how miraculous can we get? How rapidly can we heal our world? Because if we're telling a story that it's not possible, it's never going to happen. But as soon as we open up that space and we're like willing to have a new experience, we're like, oh my God, what if I love my enemy and everything works out? <sighs> And we let it, it's like, that's scary for our nervous, our nervous systems are like, oh my God, like Donald Trump could like live in peace. And so could Joe Biden and like everything would be okay. Oh my God, that sounds horrible, but also amazing. <laughs> like, letting ourselves let it happen. Um, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's profound. That's profound. That's like an entirely new thought, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. I absolutely adore you, Aaron. Just everything you say, all of who you are. I'm just, you are, you've been here many times. You, you're here for a very special reason. I feel that. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for all that you are and for devoting your life to this incredible mission. Um, thank you so much. The feeling is so mutual and I just like, I honor you. I witness you. I know the strength that it takes to show up in the way that you do. And just what a freaking blessing to, to be connected, to be here on the mission at the same time. It's just, mm. it's amazing. Amen. Amen. So let's wrap this up with the three questions that I ask every guest. Just a little quick, just a few quick questions. The first one is, what is something that you are loving right now? I am loving, oh, I'm loving writing poetry. I love to write. I love to ex I love to weave a turn of phrase, and I do that obviously so much for my work. Um, but I know that I'm really in my deepest alignment and being most myself when I feel 
organically moved just to write things for myself um, to, that, that are trying to just get words around the visceral beauty, mm. wildness of being a human. Mm. And you do it so well. Thank you. What is something that turns you on? Hmm. <sighs> People who live in the possibility mindset, like someone who doesn't have friction between what they feel called to do and their, and their willingness to actually experience it. Like I love someone who's like, great, that's the idea. Cool. How do we make it happen? Mm. Like God's going to provide. Great. You know, that budget is a hundred X what we thought it would be amazing. You know, miracles about to happen. That level of like, I want to live, I love to live on the edge with people in that way where, um, where we're having a conversation about what's the most authentic thing to create and experience, not what's the water done version that might be possible. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yes. Well, that's so deep. And finally, the last time you experienced magic. My, my mind is flooding with like so many different examples. Hmm. Yeah, the, the story that I'm, I could tell many stories of like dramatic provision where I started to see a conflict happening in my life where it's like, oh, I wonder, you know, like, am I going to be safe here or like what's going to happen? And God, and I, and I prayed and I like got in on it. And then it was like just my whole reality rearranged. And it's like, oh, you know, your flat tire is miraculously fixed or like your house looks completely different or, you know, things like that happening. But the thing that is actually coming through most prominently is I recently had a conversation with a family member who I've had quite a protracted conflict filled life with and who I always wanted like really deep recognition from and really deep like care and intention and we had this conversation and after which I realized that she had actually said everything that I had always wanted to hear in that conversation like we just caught up on the phone and and there was so much care and intention and respect and like honoring of who I was. And it was so organic that I almost missed it. Right. I almost missed all the work and all the willingness that had gone into creating a space where I didn't desperately need someone to show up for me in that way. Um, and I wasn't so attached to our narrative of conflict that it actually like it actually could come through and we could connect in a really heart centered way. So that was, that was one of those moments in the last week where I was like, wow, I'm in a new reality. Mm. All, all glory to God. I love that. Up level, next level of the game. Yep. Oh, beautiful, Aaron. Well, this has been just such a joy. So amazing to have this conversation with you. Where Likewise. Can everyone come and hang out and get more Aaron Rose in their life. Amazing. Instagram is where I do my most current creating. Um, it's Aaron X Rose. And then my website is where you can find um, more and more deeper writing and my programs and tools and things like that. And that's just AaronXRose.com. Mm, beautiful. So Aaron, we're going to take you over to the girls inside the Goddess Collective now for a few more questions that have been submitted. But for now, Thank you so much for everything. I deeply love you and appreciate you. I can't wait for you to come to Costa Rica soon for my birthday. Can't wait. <laughs> and um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you. Oh, I hope you absolutely loved that episode. I hope it has inspired you to dream bigger and to create that vision for your future. As always, if you want to join us and go deeper, come and join us inside the community. We have an incredible group of women chasing their dreams on this soul mission in life. We have workshops in there. We have workbooks, coaching calls with me, and of course, extra bonus content from all of the podcast guests. So until next time, hit subscribe, share this episode if you loved it, connect with me online and yeah, I'll see you for another episode next week.